You're listening to Accounting Matters, your go-to podcast for all things accounting, reporting, and sustainability. I'm Adam Olson, Embark's Accounting Advisory Practice Leader, and I'm happy to welcome for the first time uh, Allison Bradshaw, a Managing Director here at Embark that helps lead our ESG and sustainability services. Allison, welcome in. Exciting to have you. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. I know. We've got a, I'd say, a very uh, popular and anticipated <laughs> topic to talk about today. So we're really unpacking. It's At least at the time of this recording, it's only been about a week since the actual final SEC climate-related disclosure rule came out. Uh, I know you and I kind of did a quick LinkedIn live reaction to that um, on the day of the actual final ruling itself. Uh, but, you know, we'll spend most of today really kind of doing a deeper dive into that rule. But maybe just the level set here uh, for those that maybe have been under a rock a little bit and not <laughs> paying attention to it. Uh, the SEC did finalize its uh, climate related disclosure rule on March 6th. That rule was passed with a 3 2 commissioner vote and essentially creates a number of new required disclosure. Uh, disclosures related to climate for uh, a number of different registrants, and we'll get more into those details there. Uh, it was almost coming up on the two-year anniversary of when that original proposal first came out, so I know, uh, at least here at Embark, we've been talking about it and anticipating it and <laughs> watching that can be kicked down the road, but again, that that final rule came to fruition last week, and so uh, all 886 pages, I know we've <laughs> <Light> spent... Light reading. <laughs> Spent quite a bit of time uh, this, these past several days uh, starting to comb through it and are just happy to talk about you know, what we've uncovered today. So, but maybe just to kick us off, if you could just, just from your own personal perspective, I know you've been following this space very closely for a number of years as well. What were your kind of just initial reactions? Yeah, to that and role? I think I'll actually use the quote that you had from, from that initial discussion we had, but there was lots of there were some surprises, but it was also kind of a bit of a surprise, not surprise, right? Mm -hmm. There was a lot of um, adjustments and tweaks that were made from the initial proposed rule that I think some would say might have watered down the rule a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but what it showed to me is that the SEC commissioners who talked about the reason for their vote, they definitely both sides thought about the cost benefit analysis of this rule, but the cost to companies to, to comply as well as the benefit to the investors and what this information helps them provide from an investing perspective. And you really saw that come out and how they were thinking about it and how they were challenging certain aspects of it. And it also to me showed how thorough they were in evaluating those over 24,000 comments that came in on the rule, right? That's right. Because you definitely did see where some of those reactions from companies and, and other advisors in this space really came into play as, as some of those items were adjusted pretty significantly from the from the initial rule. Yeah, no, you're definitely on point there. And the 24,000 comments, I think, is an SEC <laughs> record. So kudos to the to the client. By far, role. I think. I think <laughs> yes. they had passed it well at like 12,000, much less 24,000. So uh, just kind of piggybacking on your point there a little bit. So with that 3-2 vote, you know, there was obviously commissioners in favor, more in favor than not. Um, I think some of the commissioners that ultimately dissented on the final rule um, pointed back that there was already existing guidance around climate yeah. that the SEC had put out. So back in 2010, there was kind of climate related disclosure guidance that was published around the subject. Obviously, this new rule kind of levels up some of that existing guidance, although that guidance is still in effect, there is now new requirements there. Um, so given that there was previous guidance, you know, what was kind of the rationale for why the SEC yeah. decided, hey, we still need this climate rule today. Yeah, and I think leveling up is probably the perfect perfect way to say that because really what they did in passing this climate rule is they did kind of enhance and standardize what was in that that 2010 guidance, right? I think there were a lot of companies who didn't know how and to what extent they needed to to use that guidance around sure. climate related risks. And as more and more investors demanded information in this space and it became very clear that what the market was missing was comparable and reliable data right. in, in the climate risk space. The SEC, with, with their role in protecting the capital markets and, and looking out for the investors from that perspective, really recognized a gap in that 2010 guidance and what the information that investors were looking for. Yeah. And, and so that's really kind of what I think drove a more prescriptive rule 
in this updated rule. I think there are some that would argue that the existing guidance companies should have been reporting quite a bit of this information to right. the extent it was relevant to them, but that wasn't always the case in practice. And so you also saw Chair Gensler really kind of point out that the investor lens is really what was driving them to to enhance this rule. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, definitely the need for more consistent, comparable, reliable information is really what this rule is trying to get at. And I, and. I do think it's important that you mentioned Chair Gensler because I think in his overarching comments, I think one thing he tried to ground the whole new rules around was that, hey, it's all centered around materiality. And yeah, we see absolutely. that throughout a number of the changes that were made in the rule um, and just in the way they spoke to some of the requirements there that it's still grounded in that kind of definition of what is material under the Supreme Court um, ruling. And so just as a reminder to any listeners out there that maybe aren't familiar with kind of that the definition of materiality? I know we've got sustainability teams that maybe historically haven't had to worry about <laughs> materiality in that sense that are now being you know brought into the fold with their finance teams to help navigate this space today. But that the Supreme Court, I don't remember how far this goes back quite a bit, and it all yeah. ties into the whole SAB 99 evaluation that a lot of uh, accounting and finance folks are familiar with, but the Supreme Court held that a fact is material if there is a substantial likelihood that that fact would have been viewed by a reasonable investor as having significantly altered the total mix of information made available. So just wanted to level set what we're talking about when we're saying material, because I think sometimes even with non-financial information and thinking about risks and materiality, it, it can be a little bit harder to get your hands around and, and, yeah. and figure out how to navigate that. Um, all right, well, let's go ahead and then move on to the rule itself. I know there's a lot to get to as far as what they required, even though, like you said, they did pare it down and <laughs> removed quite a bit. There's still a lot there. So let's just talk more broadly about some of the categories of the disclosures, because at the end of the day, it's just a disclosure rule, right? Perfect. Um, so the disclosure requirements, like you said, albeit much less in scope and scale, span two distinct categories. So we've got a number of disclosures that impact Regulation SK and a number that amend Regulation SX. And so maybe just a level set for those who aren't familiar with using those terms, Reg SK <laughs> and Reg SX. Um, the way I like to think about it, so Reg SK are going to be all the disclosures outside the financial statements that are included in a registrant's annual report or registration statement. So more commonly, you know, we tend to think of things like MDNA and risk factors as being kind of components of the filing that are subject to reg sk and so there are a number of climate related disclosures as well that would now kind of fall under the purview of reg sk and then in addition there and this was in the proposal and in, in some sense and and they still left a piece of it in there there was a amendment that's going to be made now to reg sx yeah. um, so reg sx has to do with things that are actually inside the financial yeah. statements so the consolidated financial statements footnotes there uh, there are changes there now requiring a new footnote. So uh, we will get into more of those specifics there. But maybe a question or just maybe your thoughts on, on why you think perhaps the commission decided, because I think this was also widely discussed in comment letters, yeah. was like the inclusion of something in the audited financial statements um, as part of the requirements, in addition to the stuff outside, why do you think the commission decided to include both amendments to Reg SK and SX? So I think it goes back to the point that we were discussing earlier, where really under the the existing guidance, companies should have been reporting certain things from a risk perspective in their MDNA. But I think this takes it that step further and helps with the enhancement that comes with the overall rule in that really they they drew out and drew upon the fact that those climate related risks mm -hmm. do impact your financial statements. And um, there are certain aspects of, of the climate disclosures that don't necessarily immediately impact your financial statements, but there certainly are. And I think when you think about how um, those climate related risks impact the financial statements, the things that come to mind for me are, are you in a high risk industry? For example, agriculture or insurance companies that if there's a weather related event or a climate event, they could be severely impacted pretty quickly with one event, right? Right. And that definitely has a direct impact on the financial statements. And I think one could argue that you should have been or, or many were disclosing certain facts around those events under the existing rules. 
but many weren't as well, right? And so this really kind of forces that connection yep. um, between industry and the impact on the financial statements as as well as supply chain risks as well, right? And I think, you know, COVID's the, the nice example to see how really supply chains were at risk from different things. And sure. while it wasn't, you know, particularly weather related for, for COVID, you could see how a weather event could have the same impact on the supply chain. Yeah, no, that's that's helpful to hear. All right, so let's unpack then kind of each of these categories. Maybe let's start with Reg SK. So those that those items that are outside the financial statement. So the rules themselves outline several new disclosures registrants have to include in their annual filings. I will say many of these disclosures I think can be categorized under kind of broad subtopics so like governance type disclosures strategy type disclosures risk management type disclosures and yeah. those do you know especially for registrants that you know just went through kind of this the recent cybersecurity new disclosure right. requirements they kind of had tend to have the same feel and flavor as for how they categorize the types of requirements and so we have a lot of similar items here as it relates to climate um i will say what also kind of stands out to me is you know, if you, if you are familiar with, you know, different climate reporting frameworks, like, you know, a lot of the, the subtopics that I just kind of laid out there, they do align in many respects to the recommendations of the TCFD. So there is some if inference that's kind of borrowed from a lot. And we see that throughout the SEC rule between TCFD. And I know we'll talk about later with kind of the GHG protocol that the commission isn't just kind of like pulling stuff out from nowhere. All right, let's start with the broadest one. So climate related risks and the impact to the registrant is kind of one, I think, big grouping of requirements here. So the rule itself here kind of explains that registrants must disclose, obviously, their climate related risks and potential impacts on the strategy, operations and financial condition of the entity. I do think it's Interesting that the rule, you know, it delineates between short term. So yeah. what's going to happen within the next 12 months and long term risks, those that will, you know, happen beyond 12 months. Um, as part of it, that was actually one change from the proposal. They usually had they had the kind of this short, medium yeah. and long term kind of horizon that they pointed out, which I know a lot of uh, respondents in the comment period were like, struggling with like what is considered medium versus yeah. long term and try to delineate that was yeah. a little confusing. So it is it is interesting to see that they at least amended that. Um, I think well, and I, I think it's interesting because if you talk to sustainability professionals, f professionals, they don't understand that change. And to me, I think it was to align with the definitions for short and long term that are already yeah, existing the in the financial statements, right. which to us accountants is, is very obvious why that makes a lot of sense. But it's funny because we have sustainability, more people with a direct sustainability background on our team, and they were asking questions around why that change change had sure. taken place. Yeah, because so. they're probably thinking... You know, 13 months exactly. is a really long term in my <laughs> mind, but uh, at and least medium term is definitely a, a, yeah. a defined term and as as a sustainability professional as well. So, right. So, you know, it. I think it's bringing simplicity because it takes some of that judgment out. But then, you know, some people may that historically have been used to that short, medium and long yeah. term. It's it's a new concept for them. Um, but that's also in there. Right. So you got to differentiate between kind of those short and long term risks. Um, additionally, uh, registrants need to specify whether those risks are physical or transition related. And so it's kind of distinguishing between the two categories um, and really explain how those risks affect their strategy, business model outlook and factor into any financial planning or capital allocations um, that they make as a result of those risks. Um, the rule also states that they should discuss how those risks have affected or might affect their business and provide both qualitative and quantitative yeah. descriptions of expenditures and impacts. And this is kind of driving back to your point about connectivity right between financial statements and uh, financial statement disclosures and things outside the financial statements. So like obviously here outside the financial statements, we're talking about expenditures and quantitative descriptions of those expenditures. Um, so definitely connectivity there as well as any impacts on estimates, right? So yeah. the way that these uh, climate related risks might impact financial estimates uh, and, you know, for the entity itself. Uh, registrants also, you know, have to, um, if they have plans to manage transition risk, they must disclose those plans and any progress made against those plans, along with any associated expenditures, again, or impacts on financial estimates. And then the rule also kind of goes into explaining those that are using 
scenario analyses yeah. um, must describe each of those scenarios that are used. So if you're a little more sophisticated and you're doing that, you kind of have to have a little more transparency around that, um, as well as internal carbon pricing. If you're also doing that as well, explaining how risks are evaluated or managed um, and specific information about the price must yeah. be disclosed as well. Yeah, I'm curious to see because I think I think as the proposed rule was out, the, some of the re the proposed requirements did have a cooling effect on what companies were putting out in terms of plans mm -hmm. and and progress towards those plans. So curious to see now that the rule is final, how that continues or or doesn't to right. to impact how companies are treating that. Yeah, what are you seeing from like the governance and kind of risk management side of the disclosure? Yeah, so so companies will be required to really disclose how the board of directors is overseeing and informed about climate risk. Um, they'll have to identify any board committees or subcommittees that are responsible for that oversight. And mm -hmm. so that can be anywhere from your audit committee as part of the audit, um, your comp committee to the extent there are pieces there, as well as a number of companies who have a specific ESG and sustainability committee kind of carved out amongst their board. And they'll also have to disclose whether the board oversees progress towards those climate related targets or goals that we were just talking about, right? They will also be required to disclose management's role in assessing and managing material climate related risks, including whether management positions or committees are responsible for assessing and managing the risks, the relevant expertise um, of such position holders or committee members, the processes to, to assess and manage the risks, and whether management reports information about the risks to the board and its committees or subcommittees. So lots of disclosures there around how the board is really overseeing and ensuring, I think not just compliance, but also strategy and, and the larger ESG and sustainability impact to a company, right? Yeah. And then they'll also have to describe how it determines whether it has incurred or is reasonably likely to incur a material, physical, or transition risk how it decides whether to mitigate, accept, or adapt to that risk, and how it prioritizes addressing those risks. The registrants will also be required to disclose whether and how these processes have been integrated into its overall risk management systems and processes. Yeah, definitely a lot there. But I yeah. think, like I said <laughs> in my opening remarks here around like the cybersecurity role, it's very similar, like just explaining the, the corporate governance and structure and the processes involved in addressing any risk of the business, right? Absolutely. This is just another type yeah. of risk that they're looking at and wanting to understand. So, um, and then I think the last kind of broad category here in Reg SK is, is, is kind of on the point you, you brought up, which is around uh, registrants targets or goals that they may have set. So to the extent that a registrant has um, any climate related targets or goals, uh, they're required to disclose those so long as they have materially affected or reasonably likely to materially affect the business results of operations and the financial condition of the reporting entity. Um, they would also have to disclose any activities um, included in the target, how they're kind of measuring and evaluating that target. Uh, if there's a certain time horizon, you know, a lot <laughs> of people are setting, you know, specific goals for 2050, 2060, 2030, even, you know, like dif different time horizons out there. So um, what is the time horizon they're working with? And then any baselines that they're using to then measure progress towards those targets or goals, um, obviously are important in the disclosure. If there is a specific kind of mandated time horizon, so I know a lot of jurisdictional requirements have companies that have to achieve certain, whether it's reduction of GHG emissions or net zero targets <laughs> or whatever, some of those are mandated um, by law or regulation. And if that is the case and that applies to a reporting entity, uh, that registrant would have to disclose that fact as well. And then I guess the last element of it is registrants would also be required to make additional disclosures around their targets or goals if carbon offsets or renewable energy credits, RECs, um, are a material component of that plan. So just really drawing you know, inference and putting some context around those that are achieving any targets or goals through the use of kind of offsets and recs versus maybe yeah. other means. Um, so a lot in there, right? Like there's, <laughs> I was gonna say, there's a lot it there. Is in there. And, and, and I know we'll get into more of the specifics here, but really, you know, all of these disclosures apply equally, right? To all registrant types, right. right? Like I know we'll, we're about to transition real quickly here as well, you know, into GHG emission disclosures, which do vary depending on who those impact, but at least with kind of just the more 
boiler, I don't want to say boilerplate, it's not the right word because people don't like that in, in reporting, but like the more <laughs> uh, general and kind of overarching disclosure requirements, those are pervasive across all registrant types. So quickly, since a lot of these disclosures also have a lot of forward looking elements yeah. to them, right? That's a, you're talking about future goals and targets and plans and progress and all these things. I know in the proposal, there was a lot of commentary around or at least worry around, hey, this stuff is hard to predict. Yeah. We don't want to be kind of held liable if we say something or do something. Um, and all of a sudden something changes. Um, are there any protections provided? So in the final rule, were there any safe harbors that were extended or how did the SEC kind of address the concern around safe harbors? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And I think the, the, uh, old auditor and, and accountant in me would point out that those are no different than a lot of, of management estimates, right? But I think the SEC was actually very sympathetic to those perspectives because they did put in those safe harbors around a number of forward-looking elements of what's required under the final rule. And those include disclosures over um, the scenario analyses, the internal carbon pricing, transition plans, and the targets and goals. And so they definitely, in my, in my view, were very responsive to those concerns and really put in the protections yep. um, for registrants in that space. Good. I'm which sure. to me just a lot of people took a, yeah. a, a sigh of relief right <laughs> exactly which to me actually shows that they want to encourage the intent behind the rule sure. and to to have companies putting more information out there in this space and they don't intend to kind of regulate like force it from a regulation perspective so right. yep okay all right, so I, I know I kind of already teased this a bit, but the kind of the other major category of disclosures, at least under Reg SK, so outside of kind of the more general ones we just talked about, is specific disclosures over certain GHG emissions. Can you walk me through? I know there were a lot of changes here <laughs> from the proposal. Um, many people probably already aware of this, listening to this, but just in case you aren't, there are several changes from the proposal that ultimately found its way into the final rule. Uh, but maybe walk through what are the requirements for disclosing GHG emissions for registrants, you know, maybe particularly like what scopes of emissions yeah. are in are in play here and maybe even which entities even have to worry about including GHG emission yeah, disclosures. Ab absolutely. So your accelerated and large accelerated filers are going to be required to disclose scope one and scope two if material. You'll notice those of you familiar with, with emissions accounting, scope three is left out of that equation. Um, but scope one and scope two will need to be reported separately by greenhouse gas, as well as in terms of, of CO2 equivalents, so carbon dioxide equivalents. If any of those GHG gases defined in the rules, so reminder for everyone that's carbon dioxide, take me back to my, my chemistry, <laughs> chemistry days, class. if you will, yep. uh, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, hydrofluorocarbons, perfluorocarbons, sulfur hexafluoride, and nitrogen trifluoride. How'd I do? I think you did pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Is individually material. It'll need to be disaggregated and presented um, separately. And I think that's no different from how financial statement disclosures are approached, right? Yeah. So I think one of the other questions that came up in terms of GHG reporting was mm -hmm. upon phase in, will you need to disclose comparative information, which obviously then takes your effective data centrally back a year. And so what the SEC did there to, to really help address some of that is if you're a company who is already reporting GHG emissions, you would in the first year of adoption um, present comparative GHG emissions. Um, however, if you weren't, you could phase in that comparative um, disclosure in the second year of GHG emission requirements. Yeah. So just kind of adding on as you go, if you this is something you haven't started yet. That's right. Yeah. And again, that's only for accelerated and large accelerated filers. So that's right. in the original proposal, right, we had, I think it was everybody. Yeah, yeah. it was. I mean, right. So um, obviously we've tempered that a bit and <laughs> provided some relief to EGC, smaller exactly. reporting companies, and even the non-accelerated filers. So, And I think that was one area that got a lot of attention just because so many other disclosures have mm -hmm. adjustments and modifications for EGCs and those smaller reporting companies. And I think everyone was pretty shocked that, that this proposed rule didn't have the same. Right. So. Okay. So you mentioned scopes one and two, and 
I feel like most people these days yeah. have been forced <laughs> to learn what those are and what those mean, but maybe just for if we have anyone new listening that yeah. isn't familiar with the concept of scope one and scope two, yeah. could you just break down that definition? Absolutely. So scope one emissions are your direct greenhouse gas emissions. So think if you have a company owned fleet of cars or vehicles, airplanes, or if there are emissions that are emitted as part of your production process or manufacturing process, those are all scope one. Okay. Scope two are your uh, purchased emissions. So think purchased electricity, heating, cooling, that sort of thing. That would fall into scope two. Gotcha. So more indirect in the scope two than the That's right. scope one. And then obviously what you mentioned, scope three, nowhere to be found, at least in the rule. That's obviously right. they still exist. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> And there's a lot of people, advocates out there that would argue the exclusion of scope three. Uh, they are not happy about that, but yeah. I think there's uh, probably a lot of reasons for why the SEC ultimately decided not to move forward with scope three. So what are your kind of thoughts on why the SEC, because it wasn't the original proposal, although they did have the materiality definition in the proposal. And now they've decided to just yank it out altogether. Yeah. And I, I do think scope three was one of the most frequently commented on areas of um, those 24,000 comment letters. So mm -hmm. it was definitely a focus for all types of responders to this. Um, and while you kind of alluded to the fact that there are a lot of supporters for the disclosure of scope three, um, there were lots of problems with it as well, I think, from the SEC's perspective. And so from the company's perspective, it's something that actually is is very burdensome. So I didn't I didn't define it as part of the previous question, but scope three is really all the emissions up and down the entire value chain mm -hmm. of, of a company's business. And so what that means is it's including a lot of data and information that's not within the company's control. And I think when you're talking about reporting and regulatory reporting specifically, that's always kind of a red flag for companies in terms of a risk perspective and something that they don't aren't very comfortable with. And so I think the SEC was was responding to that pretty significantly by yeah. the removal of that. No, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I also think there's there's some aspects of taking that out that help. Um, insulate the rule against some of the expected legal challenges that come. Sure. One of the big uh, concerns around this expansion of the disclosure requirements by the SEC with scope three in was that they were exceeding their authority by um, indirectly regulating private companies, which is not within their, their authority. And so because those private companies would presumably have to report to these public registrants, right? Some of their emissions data in order to, for that registrant yeah. to fully disclose their scope three emissions. That's, a, that's exactly yeah. right. And so I think there's also a little bit of an aspect of removing that from the equation mm -hmm. to help ensure that this final rule kind of survives to implementation and effective reporting. Yeah. And it'll be interesting just to kind of watch the evolution here. Yeah. I think we <laughs> talked about this in the kind of the initial reaction was that seem like they maybe left the door open. Obviously, it's not a part of the rule today, yeah. but like, does that mean as sentiments change or maybe people get more comfortable with the concept of scope three and the reliability or maybe the inherent uncertainty and estimates that are embedded in the concept itself and that just becomes more widely accepted? Um, you know, it, it, we may see some evolution here yeah. in the, with the SEC's rule on this because there is a number of other and we've talked about climate rules on this podcast and even just in other things here at Embark that do require scope three. And there's a lot of entities that are subject to this rule. Yeah. We're also going to be subject to other rules that will require scope three. So you may have kind of ducked out with the SEC, but you're likely implicated in some other form or fashion. Yeah. No, that's exactly right. And, I, you know, it's funny because a lot of the the literature materials that people have already put out or even just reactions to it that people have been put out is there's there's all already a lot of people professionals perspectives that would suggest if your scope three emissions are material to you as a company mm -hmm. how can you even with them being excluded from this rule continue to exclude them from your reporting right. if you believe they're material to your company. And so I do think it'll be interesting to see how it evolves. And we've discussed previously, Chairman Gensler certainly said very clearly, scope three is out, 
for now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Operative words right there. Exactly. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. No, more to come there. Um, I guess I'll just add on to some of the requirements around the GHG emission. So, you know, if you are subject to having to include these disclosures, so accelerated or large accelerated filers, you also would have to describe the methodology, your inputs, assumptions used to calculate those emissions, right? So what are the protocol standards, your organizational boundaries? I think for most people, it's probably going to follow the GHG protocol, the most widely used um, kind of set of standards that are out there. Um, but you aren't required to. So if you happen to be um, doing something differently under another widely accepted um, protocol or standard, you are welcome to do that. You just have to disclose and explain that. I think it's also important to know that there was some changes and or at least providing more flexibility around the organizational boundary for admissions. So originally in the proposal, uh, the boundary was really defined by the financial statements and what ultimately consolidates into the financial statements. There's more flexibility here now. So they allow any of the kind of the widely used, um, I guess, approaches that are outlined in the GHG protocol. So that could be operational control as an option. You could have just kind of your more traditional consolidated financial kind of boundary itself. So there is some flexibility there, but you do need to at least explain if you decide not to, you know, if the boundaries do differ materially from what would have been included. If you used your kind of consolidated financial statement approach, you do have to explain that as well. Um, just so people have some context for, hey, if you're if you're viewing it differently and including yeah. emissions or excluding certain emissions because Um, you've taken a different approach under the GHG protocol or other similar standards, Uh, you know, let let the users and the investors know that. So I guess we've talked a bit about, well, we've talked more than a bit about materiality, (laughs) I would say, um, in here, right? Because we talked about scope one and scope two emissions are only required if material for certain types of registrants. Um, We talked about materiality as it relates to what climate risks you identify and have to report and disclose around. Um, So there's obviously a lot of materiality that's really kind of overarching and kind of a a common thread through all of this. If you are a registrant and you're thinking through, and obviously there's going to be more more work done here than what we'll probably discuss in this podcast, but like just high level, if you're thinking through like about evaluating what is material and what is how to apply materiality to this, like what are some things you know, that typically registrants would want to like sort through? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Cause I think while the definition of materiality is the same, the right. application of it is a little bit different right. in this space. Um, and so I would say that really what it is a bit more than your approach to financial statement materiality is it's really taking both those quantitative and qualitative aspects of it mm-hmm. and really evaluating the total mix of information that you have um from a climate risk perspective right um which which is really exactly how the definition works for financial reporting as well it's just that in that scenario it tends to become more of a a quantitative analysis whereas this has a lot more qualitative factors kind of feeding into it um and i also think the thing that is a little challenging for climate risk specifically is that those answers can be very different in the short term and the long term right sure Um, When you think about climate impacts, rising sea levels, you know, any sort of climate related event that is being projected in the, you know, using sustainability uh, timeframes, medium to long term, Mm -hmm. um, the answers for companies are going to look very different than they do in, in the next 12 months. Right. And so having to layer that into the analysis and the thought process is something that will be a little bit different for companies. Yeah, definitely some new not new yeah. work to do there right you know <laughs> exactly. like i think finance people like conceptually get it but they're probably going to need you know if they're ta- tackling at this themselves kind of recalibrating the way their mind's thinking about this stuff right. or sustainability folks that you know kind of understand this you know short and long-term outlook but maybe don't really know how to apply the materiality standard is right. kind of you know meshing that up um and i will say you know, you obviously were speaking to the climate related risks and disclosures around that um, clearly important. But then, you know, the same definition of materiality applies equally to those that have to provide the greenhouse gas yeah. emission disclosures. Right. No, so scopes point. one and scope two. Um, and I think the rule itself is very explicit around that. Hey, materiality in the sense of emissions is not just 
determined solely by the amount of the emissions themselves. So it's not just that quantitative number of emissions that maybe you're always going to make scope one or scope two material or not material to a registrant. Um, and they really have to think more holistically about the total mix. Um, and so there are some examples I know given in the rule itself and as they're kind of explaining the rationale. So they kind of point to things like, you know, you, investors are going to want to understand, you know, whether certain emissions are currently or reasonably likely to be subject to increased taxes or financial penalties. Maybe that could drive something to be more material, whether, you know, certain emissions maybe trigger a certain transition risk that's material. Um, and that could be, you know, specific to any foreign or state other GHG emissions reporting requirements. Um, or if there's certain emissions that, you know, are critical towards achieving, you know, a reduction, you know, target or goal or transition plan, then obviously that might drive someone to believe that, hey, these types of emissions are important to report on. So one thing they did keep, I guess, in the final rule was assurance requirements yeah. around emissions, right? So they've thrown out maybe who has to provide those <laughs> disclosures for some people, uh, but they have left the assurance requirements around emissions, although they've you know, we'll talk about it. They punted the timeline a bit here. Yeah. What do the assurance requirements look like and who do they impact? Yeah. So I guess I'll talk about it in terms of large accelerated and accelerated. So when you look at large accelerated, they would the year of first reporting would be 2026 subject for GHG emissions. Mm -hmm. And so they have a three year phase in for limited assurance. So that takes you to 2029. Um, and then an additional four years for reasonable assurance. Okay. So actually quite some time to kind of layer in and phase in those assurance requirements. Yeah, probably also allowing even some of these assurance providers time to maybe sort through their methodologies. <laughs> methodology, <and> <laughs> kind of upskill, build their teams as yeah. well. I'm sure there was probably some worrisome, especially you think about the accounting firms out there that are you know, likely to serve this type of work and provide that level of assurance, although they don't have, doesn't only have to be accounting firms, um, you know, just giving them some runway as well to develop their teams and have like the being able to respond yeah. to the demand for the assurance requirement. Now, the part I do find interesting because I, I think when you think about just the mindset and approach for certainly your large accelerated, but probably your accelerated filers as well, I think they're going to want to, for the most part, be certain they are assurance ready when they start reporting, right? Because you don't want to run the risk of having to restate or correct or amend something that you previously disclosed because yep. you didn't you didn't have a, a full process and, and control framework in place that helps you get reliable data yeah. upon initial report. So yeah. And then for accelerated <laughs> filers, right? They're they're only stuck with limited assurance. They actually don't That's transition right. they to have, reasonable. They have two years longer to report, so they also have two years longer to phase in that yeah, limited so assurance. Twenty thirty one for them. So it seems a long ways off, but <laughs> you know, uh, we always like to say now's the time to you know. It's a journey. Better sooner than later, <laughs> right? Don't be caught flat footed by you know putting this off too long. Um, and then I guess maybe just to, to add on around the assurance providers, like you know, we talked about likely accounting firms handling a lot of this doesn't have to be. I think whoever the assurance provider is, though, you know, they'll still have to obviously be independent uh, under SEC rules and clearly need to have significant experience in understanding this information and reporting on this information. Um, and so I think you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see who kind of comes out of the, the woodworks there as being yeah. some of the common assurance providers, you know, yeah. maybe there'll be a new industry that develops, but you know, more to come there as well. Absolutely. No, well, and I also think it's probably not something to overlook the, the impact that that assurance industry is going to have on how this ultimately is, yeah. is implemented and enforced. Right. Sure. So. All right. Let's switch gears to then to reg SX. So those financial statement disclosure, so footnotes um, next. So the rule here is going to require registrants to disclose certain climate related financial statement effects and related disclosures in a footnote that are now in the audited financial statement. Yep. So that brings a whole host of things with it. <laughs> and, you know, I think, like we talked about at the beginning here, this is there's an element that's still retained from the proposal, but this is also a significant area of change. There was actually much more information that was going to have to be included 
and the way you evaluated this information in the proposal uh, was a lot more discreet. Um, and so th there has been some tempering there as well, like we've seen in other parts of the rule. Um, but at its core, so there is a separate disclosure is required that you know will highlight the impacts from severe weather events and other natural conditions relating to either capitalized costs and charges, as well as any expenditures expensed as incurred and losses incurred. Companies will also have to disclose any recoveries related to those amounts. Um, and they also, the rule itself has established specific disclosure thresholds. So these sounds vaguely familiar if you followed the proposal, <laughs> but they did make some tweaks here. So if you think about kind of the two different captions that kind of go into that footnote, so you've got capitalized costs and charges, uh, there is a kind of threshold that was established here. So it's only required, an entity is only required to disclose those capitalized costs and charges if the absolute value of the aggregated impact is 1% or more of the absolute value of that registrant stockholders equity or deficit at the end of that fiscal year, subject to a $500,000 de minimis. Um, and then from the expenditures and loss side, it's also similar. So you've also got that kind of 1% threshold, but here it's based on the absolute value of kind of pre-tax uh, net income for that fiscal year. And it's subject to a lower de minimis of $100,000. So still has a low bar here, but you know, like I said, it's not that kind of like line item by line item right. analysis that they had in the original proposal. So I do think this helps simplify it a bit. Okay. Um, so we'll see what happens. Yeah, I would also add that the rule clarifies that if severe weather events or natural conditions is a significant contributing factor in that expense or that loss or, or mm -hmm. capitalized cost, uh, the entire amount must be included um, in the disclosure with separate disclosures of where amounts are presented within the financial statement. So yeah. just something to, to think about there as well. Yeah, and, that's, and that is a change because I think the proposal itself had this attribution principle. So you were actually supposed to try to figure <laughs> out, or that was kind of like how it was yeah. worded or maybe, um, and there was a lot of questions around that as well. Yeah. Like people having to make these judgments around like you have a certain event, how much of that is truly related to climate how much is not. And yes. I think this kind of takes out some of that judgment and, and questioning yeah. there. And right, like you said, like if it's just considered a significant contributing factor, you know, like so even if it's only 50% of that expense, right. you would pull the whole thing in yeah. right to this disclosure. Um, so a little less maybe judgment needed there. That should yeah. maybe simplify it a bit. Um, I don't know. I guess well, and I don't think that's super surprising because I think a lot of the pushback was like, what's weather? What's climate? How do sure. we de decipher between those two things? And so I think you're exactly right. It kind of helps remove some of those barriers and some of that uncertainty and gives people a clearer path into to what they're reporting. Yeah. Um, so there are also additional quantitative financial statement disclosures mm -hmm. for amounts expensed, capitalized losses incurred related to carbon offsets and the the wrecks that you talked about earlier. Yep. Um, so if they're a material component of plans to achieve climate related targets or goals, they would need to be included. Okay. And then I think the last one is really just around like any impacts, right? So qualitative disclosures around right. impacts to any financial yep. estimates or assumptions uh, that obviously relate to severe weather events or other natural conditions um, or that are disclosed in targets or transition plans. So not a surprise there. Um, but one one question I know a lot of people are, yeah. are wrestling with here is the interoperability <laughs> conversation. So how do these new disclosures in this SEC rule align or not align. I think we've already kind of previewed a bit that they don't fully align with other kind of climate disclosure regulations or frameworks yeah. that are out there that are widely used. Yeah, and and I think there is a lot of interoperability between them. There are also a lot of differences <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that exist as well. I do think the SEC was was careful to align where they could with with CSRD, for instance, and some of the other international standards. Um, that exist uh, under IFRS and the ISSB guidelines. I can't tell fully how much they considered California's proposal because obviously this creates a disconnect on the federal and state level in terms of GHG emission disclosures. Yep. And so that's one place where I think you will start to see differences. And I even think there were some questions that, that were poked at by some of the commissioners around, have they overridden or kind of negated California's regulation in this place, which I'm certain was 
a question aimed at some of the litigation that they're expecting to come in in this space around some of the disclosures. But I I do think there's a a lot of overlap between SEC's climate rule and CSRD, for instance. Um, They're all based on on the TCFD and that, that disclosure framework that existed previously. Sure. And they've all tried to keep that as closely aligned as possible, which I do think is helpful for companies that have to report across multiple jurisdictions because yeah. you can have certain kind of no regrets actions that are applicable to to the broad um, regulation environment. And then you'll have some specifics that come out under under right. each individual Always jurisdiction. A top off well. thing. There's no full <laughs> equivalency, at least not yet. Like no one's exactly. deemed anything as equivalent to the other exactly. per se, but uh, definitely ways to like have shared benefits across some of these different reporting requirements in most cases. Um, Okay, well, that's helpful. So let's, uh, I guess, lastly, you know, talking about transition timeline, I think is really kind of the last thing we haven't hit on. I think it's not the most straightforward kind of transition (laughs) plan. There's a million ways to cut it. There are. (laughs) uh, So I would encourage listeners to definitely go look at the rule itself. Um, There's a number of you know, pieces of the, the the rule that do fall into different time frames depending on the registrant type and then even like right. the types of disclosures that you need to put forth. They all kind of stair step in over time. And then obviously we talked about the assurance components coming in much later, but eventually coming in. Um, but really kind of the first wave of people having to deal with any of these new disclosure requirements are going to be those large accelerated filers in 2025, yeah. right? And then you've got accelerated kind of following the year after that in 2026. And then, as we mentioned, although, you know, not accelerated EGCs, SRCs don't have to worry about the greenhouse gas emissions. They do. They are subject to all the other disclosure requirements. And that, again, would be phased in in 2027. Um, And then there's phasing and even of different disclosures. So some of the like the financial statement disclosures we talked about, so expenditures and impacts. They come a little bit later as well as uh, the GHG emission disclosure. So won't won't break it all down. I think it's hard to illustrate in, in mm-hmm. words. I think it's better best seen visually in my mind, at least. So Absolutely. definitely encourage people to uh, to go look at that. And, and again, you know, some of this stuff may seem a little off for you as far as when it's required to be reported on. But if you just think about a lot of the work that goes into some of this stuff, it really isn't that far away, yeah. which brings me probably to my last question for you, which is some companies may be thinking again, you know, hey, I don't have to worry about this till 2027. It's 2024. We're midway, partially through, well, I guess, quarter of the way through 2024 at the time of this recording. You know, what would you say to them as far as what they need to be thinking about as far as preparedness? Yeah, so I guess I have a couple couple thoughts there. I, I think the first being, I think it's always helpful to know the road that you have ahead of you. And so I would say at a minimum, I think it's helpful for companies to truly do that gap assessment evaluation of what they have and what they don't and what Mm -hmm. they need to be able to comply with this. That way you can make an informed decision on really when and and how urgently you need to get started on certain aspects of it. It can take companies quite some time, years, to kind of go along that journey and be ready to comply with a a rule of this significance. Yep. And so um, you at least wanna know what road you have ahead of you so that you can make that decision uh, from an informed perspective. Uh, I would also say that kind of to the point we talked about earlier with assurance being a long way off, it does seem to give you some additional time. But I also think when you think about it um, strategically, you want you want to be ready when you're first reporting. And so that does require maybe a little bit more attention up front than you initially think when you look at some of the timelines that were laid out by the SEC. Yeah, no, that's, that's helpful. And I know we... We touched on it lightly, but what would you say? There's legal challenges that have already been raised on the rule, right? And who knows how any of that will play out or not play out or whatever. But if you're a company that's waiting for all that to get sorted out, good advice, bad advice? I think Uh, it's generally bad advice because I think (laughs) unless a court, like an appeals court makes a a determination very quickly, it won't be able to work its way up to the Supreme Court to ultimate decision making uh, by the time that you have to comply. And so uh, typically these things take very long. So unless the Supreme Court chooses to accelerate that for for some reason, uh, you will probably need to be complying with this rule before it is ever sorted in the courts. So no, no, makes sense. (laughs) 
Awesome. So well, I wouldn't wait for that. <laughs> yeah. Good advice there, right? Uh, better safe than sorry. That's right. Uh, and like we said, you know, you might be implicated by some other rules and That's a right. lot of the work you're doing for this one is uh, universally beneficial to meet other requirements of other reporting uh, obligations. So, well, I appreciate, I think that brings us to a close for today. Uh, so thanks, Allison, for sharing all your wisdom in this space. I know we'll probably have many, many more podcasts just even digging into aspects of this yeah. rule and other uh, sustainability reporting uh, matters as they continue to evolve and companies really kind of start getting pulled into the uh, the reporting compliance deadlines and obligations over the next several years, really. Um, but for today, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. And so to our listeners, uh, you know, definitely reach out to Allison or I if you'd like to connect, uh, have any questions or want to, you know, get to know us better. And until next time, thanks for listening to another episode of Accounting Matters. Mm-hmm.